Almighty God, we do need thee every hour. We need you for those times that are so hard in our lives, those times that we feel so alone and the times that we feel that we have no one to talk to, but we know that we can always come to you with those things that are on our hearts and those things that we cry out sometimes and, and just ask to be heard. Lord, we come to a time of prayer this morning with gratefulness and, and joy in our hearts for the many ways you provide guidance and direction to us, your people. We're thankful for your holy word with its rich messages that help us to better understand who you are and how much you love us. We're also grateful for the many people who have come before us, who have taught us through their stories and by their example how to serve you and take the message of your gospel throughout the world. Lord, we ask that you will continue to teach and lead us so that we can become better servants who are ready and willing at all times to do the work that you have planned ahead for us. Lord, all these things we lift up to you in prayer, as well as the many silent requests of our hearts. We do this in the name of our risen Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture is found in the book of Acts, chapter 8, and we'll be reading part of verse 1 through verse 8. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. You can join me as we pray for Pastor Mike today. <clears throat> Lord, there was great joy in the cities when impure spirits came out and when you performed signs and wonders through Philip. And Lord, our prayer today is that as uh, your servant Mike comes to share today, that the spirits that we wrestle with would come out, Lord, that the signs and wonders that, that we need to see in our lives would be made manifest, God, through the preaching and the hearing of your word today. Bless Mike as he comes, Lord. Give him your message, and may he preach it boldly. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Steve. Good morning. I'm grateful to uh, be here on a Sunday morning with you again in the midst of uh, this week. Uh, were some great celebrations. I actually think, Vicki, when you were saying the prayer, this is like the first week in about six weeks we haven't had a birth in our congregation. Um, so we are growing, but get busy. Um, that was funny. I um, want to talk just a few things about summer games before uh, we go forward. It, it was a fantastic work week, as, as all three of these have, have set up here. I, I want to tell you a, a, about a couple experiences and, and then share with you a little expectation you know, I've been preaching in churches for nearly 30 years now. And one thing I noticed that's very different at camp <clears throat> than in the local church. Thursday night, and I've got about six or seven faces that I saw, can attest this to be true, because they were with us. Thursday night, we began worship at 6.30. At 12.05, after midnight, we had to, we felt as pastors, we had to conclude the worship. And you know what happened? When the woman pastor went up there to say, okay, we got to shut it down, you know what happened to her? She got booed. <laughs> Didn't she? Didn't she? Didn't Lexi get booed? Boo, we don't want to stop worshiping our God. Are you kidding me? Five and a half hours. I'm sometimes 10 minutes into a sermon. I got people, this work? <laughs> <laughs> I 
Now, be, be assured of this, friends. Our box confines how long we can go. We're aware of that. But understand also that the word of the living God is timeless and it's timely. And we want to speak to you of its timeless and timely truth this morning. And it is, it is a word that reaches into your life. Let's get to our fourth minister of renown. Pastor Keith told you a little bit about Philip the minister. Let me fill you in a few blanks. Our fourth minister in this series that we've been working through Acts, the fourth ministry of, uh, minister of renown, we talked about Peter, then we talked about Paul, and then we talked about Stephen, and now we're going to go to Philip. Now, Philip is a contemporary of Stephen. They lived at the same time. And Philip was not one of the 12. Don't, don't get this confused. There is a Philip that is an apostle of Jesus, one of the 12 disciples. The Philip, the minister of the church in Acts, is not that Philip. We're talking about Philip who, along with Stephen, was one of the seven. One of those seven Greek-speaking um, Christians that were brought in to, to, to heal that conflict between the Hebraic and the Hellenistic Jews in Jerusalem to, for the distribution of the food. So, St so Stephen and Philip were working together on that. And like Stephen, Philip was a man who is pointed to as one being full of the Holy Spirit. Now, Stephen's ministry was very brief. Now, obviously, he was in ministry long enough so that people would know that he was a man filled with the Holy Spirit. They put him in charge. But we also know that very early in his time as an administrator, Stephen was, of course, approached by the Jewish leaders. He gave that speech, which is Acts chapter 7. And then, of course, he was stoned. His ministry was very brief in its longevity. Philip, on the other hand, had a long ministry. A very long ministry. He was contemporary with, with, with Stephen, and we still see him in ministry 20 years later. In the persecution that Paul led, that, that, that just scattered all of the Christians out of Jerusalem, Philip was one of those. So Philip was driven out of Jerusalem by Paul, and interestingly enough about how grace and the Holy Spirit works, we find later in Acts, in the 21st chapter, that this very same Philip, hosted Paul in his home 20 years later. So first Paul was trying to kill him, and then they became BFFs because of Jesus Christ. They became best friends because of Jesus Christ. Now Philip is one of the kind in the New Testament. More than 15 people are named apostles in the New Testament. But there is only one that is called the evangelist, and that's Philip. Acts chapter 21, 8 says that Paul went to stay with Philip the evangelist. Many people, Timothy and others, are given to do the work of the evangelist. All, of Christ, all, all Christians are, to give, are given the task of being evangelists, which is simply sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. But only one person is called the evangelist. And that's Philip the evangelist. And church history and tradition fills out a lot of that. Now today, I really only want to share with you two words. But as a pastor, you know I'll spend a few moments doing that. Two words about Philip's ministry. And if you're a guy, a guy or a gal that writes stuff down, here are the two words. Philip went and Philip spoke. These are the defining characteristics of his ministry. In Acts chapter 8, verse 5, what, what Keith read was that Philip went to Samaria. Now, for whatever reasons, even though the disciples got the same command in Matthew 28 and in Mark 16 to go throughout the whole world and <clears throat> spread the gospel, for whatever reason, they were reluctant to leave Jerusalem, and they left. We don't know the reason. Church history doesn't tell us the reason. Scriptures don't tell us the reason. What we do know is that Philip went. And went implies action. You can't went if you're sitting still. Okay? Okay? To went, you have to have gone, right? You have to go. And go implies action. Went implies action. Listen to this. Some of you are at the age where you ha might have grandchildren. And so you can empathize and understand others that might have grandchildren. And if you ever talk to one of your friends that's a grandparent and they say, I went to see my grandkids this week, you know just what their life was about. They went somewhere, and there were little people running all around them, and they were afraid all day that this was going to get knocked over, and they're glad to be home. 
right? They loved it when they were there, but they went there. They went there, and there was all this action around there, lots of, of stuff going on. And that's what the gospel speaks to us. That's what Philip's uh, ministry is all about. Philip went, Mark 16, verse 15, it says, Go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Philip went. He went first to Samaria. And as he preached, the response there was astonishing. It had to have been. People were coming to Christ by the hundreds. It was so astonishing that finally, Peter and John left Jerusalem, went to Samaria. And remember, now Samaria is not the hometown. Now, that is not uh, the, necessarily the good guys in the biblical story until we get into the New Testament. They, the, the Jews were afraid of them. They were mortal enemies at some point. But, but Philip's ministry in Samaria was so astonishing, so, so good, that Peter and John, the disciples, the apostles of Christ, went to just check it out. They went there to see what Philip was doing and to rejoice with those that have become saints. Now, we have to ask the question, how reluctant are we to go? How reluctant are we to go? We've often said about camp or a Christian men's retreat or women of faith or something like that, the hardest part of the whole retreat, the whole experience, is closing the car door behind you. Because once you close that car door, you're going. You have, and eventually you'll be able to say, we went to camp. We went to, to Women of Joy. We went to these places. Now, but we're reluctant to go. Not long ago in, in May, my family was on vacation. We were outside Canyon City, Colorado. We went to the Royal Gorge. You seen it? Have you ever seen the Royal Gorge? Okay, for those of you that haven't seen it, the Royal Gorge is a gorge. I mean, it's just, it's just it's probably 2,000 feet, just you know, sheer rock walls down to the river before, below it. Now, humanity at one point or another said, you know, this is pretty cool. We better build a bridge across it. And that was pretty neat. And for a long time, people went back and forth across the bridge. You can still do that together. You go to the, you know, you go to the Iowa flag on the bridge, and you look down, and you know, there. And if you're an eighth grade boy, you spit and see how long it takes to go down there. But you, you look over there, and you're, you're way up above, and it's kind of dangerous. But then later on, they put an a, a inclined railroad down there, and then they put a gondola. And none of those were scary enough for some people. So you've, anybody that's been to Wisconsin Dells or any other kind of tourist trap, you've seen these giant swings they build. They built one of these giant swings. It's got this apparatus that goes up way, probably at least as high as the sanctuary ceiling, uh, probably 60, 70 feet. And you lay in this harness, and they, you know, winch you up to the top, and then they let you go. And when you go, you fly out over the rim of the Royal Gorge, and you're looking down in it. Now, there was a lot of people that were standing in line that had paid 60 bucks to have that experience. And I thought to myself, few of them were reluctant, few of them were kind of scared. And I was very reluctant to go because it's stupid. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I wasn't, I mean, anything that's got this fence around it, and I said to the guy, what's this fence for? He says, well, to keep you back. Why are you afraid people will get hit by the swing? They're like, no, the vomit. I'm like, any, anything, I mean, this is serious, I'm being serious. Anything that has to have that kind of barrier, I'm reluctant to go on. But that kind of reluctancy, that just seems intelligent to me. That there, there are things that we should be reluctant to do. But then Christians, think about this. There are other things that we're reluctant about that we shouldn't be so reluctant about, you know. I've known so many of you over the years, and, and, I, and I look into your spirits, and I see this profound belief. I mean, we profoundly believe. And when Vicki starts talking about prayer at the property, I hear a lot of you saying, I'm going. I'm going. I'm, I'm already planning to go. Or, I've gone, or I've sat in my house for the last few years and prayed for that, or I've prayed for the concerns that are in the bulletin or the things she said. And we have this, this, these people, our congregation, you are filled with this richness of prayer. You pray for me, you pray for Keith, you pray for Vicki, you pray for the church, you pray for each other. There is that, that richness in us. And I know there's been, over the years, this, um, 
these hearts of generosity that will send kids to camp, that will, you know, make sure our buildings run, that will reach out in service and concern to the world. And there are so many of you that have this deep relationship with Jesus Christ and you personally follow him all day long. And, and this is the piece I want to share with you, and we're often reluctant, we're often reluctant to represent Jesus away from here. We're often reluctant to represent Jesus in the places that we spend a lot of our day and a lot of our time. You see, the Christian must go into the world and be a representative for Christ. We told the students all week long, look, summer games is not about teaching you to live as a Christian here. That's easy. You're surrounded by it all the time. The point of this is to take your Christianity back into the world in which you live among people that have not had this experience and simply be willing to live the life of Christ for them. We cannot be reluctant in this. All of us live in the world. We're all here. And yet, we have a lot of reasons to be reluctant. And Philip's ministry says, you must go. Because that's what he did. He spent his ministry going. Philip went. Now, the second word I want to, to, to persuade you with this morning is another simple word. And that is that Philip spoke. He spoke. He did not hesitate to speak. I have, now I want to make sure you understand this. I have in my office, anybody that's ever been in this office, since the day I moved into that office, right above the light switch as you leave my door, it reminds me of how to, to, to act and live as a Christian. There is this quote from St. Francis of Assisi. It says this, Preach the gospel always. Preach the gospel always. If necessary, use words. Okay? Preach the gospel always. If necessary, use words. And I think that's an absolute important thing for us to witness to Jesus Christ with the things that we do, with, with the way that we live. It is absolutely important that when someone looks at us, they can say, I don't know much, but I know that's a Christian because of the way they're living. This is absolutely important. But I have a cautionary tale to add to my own thought process here. It is important for us to understand if that is all we do with the testimony. It is important for us to understand that for a long time, even though Assisi, Francis of Assisi, was not part of the Protestant Reformation or tradition, there have been a lot of Protestants that have drunk in those words and said, preach the gospel always, if necessary, use words, and interpreted that to mean my life testimony, my being a good Christian person, my living out the faith is enough of a testimony. I shan't need to speak words if I'm good enough at that. Well, let me share this with you in regards to that. I've stood not too long ago, maybe a couple years in a hospital hallway with one of the great men that I've known's family. And in the hallway, there was an adult son and an adult daughter that said, Mike, Pastor Mike, they didn't know me very well. Pastor Mike, we know for sure that dad is a good man, but he never expressed his faith to us. And that just flayed me. How can you know someone 50, 60 years that lives like this and not know the kernel or the crop of their testimony of who they are? See, living what you believe is important. It is absolutely critical for us to live what we believe, and it's half our testimony. It's only half our testimony. But, you know, Philip's ministry says to us, at some point, to advance the good news of Jesus Christ. At some point, to advance the gospel of Christ, you're going to have to open your mouth and speak of it. You're going to have to open our mouths and speak of it. See, I've watched for years as people spoke ad nauseum about their car company. You ever heard a good Chevy Ford debate? Chevy's great, Ford's terrible. I mean, I went on the internet. You know, last week, a couple guys in Georgia, this won't surprise you, Lauren, you're from North Carolina, a couple guys in Georgia stabbed each other over which was better, Chevy or Ford. 
right? But why can't a Ford owner just get in their Ford, put their arm out the window? They spent $30,000 for it, drive down the road and say, you people can see I love Ford. They still have to argue about it over a car. You really want to get it going? Argue with people over their computer platform. Mac's awesome. PCs are great. I mean, they don't have knife fights. They create some, you know, digital playground on SimCity and fight it out there or something. I don't know. But, but you see, we will have people that will testify to us about a carburetor more profoundly than they will testify about their faith. We will te- have people testify to us whether Windows or DOS is more effective in your life than we will about Christ. We have to open our mouths. We have to be unafraid to open our mouths and speak of the Lord in our situations. Now, I've, of course, been really clear about this over the years. We're not expecting most of you to come up here and grab a microphone and preach. We don't expect you to stand up at Hy-Vee during the coffee hours. And, 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 you know, when people are sitting out there at 8.15 tomorrow, I don't expect anybody to come out there and say, a word from the Lord, you know, and start talking. That's... That's not, unless you're motivated to do that, unless the Spirit works to you. I'm not expecting you to, you know, to start throwing gospel bombs over the, you know, over the uh, cubicle next to you. That's, that's really not. But what we are, but what the Lord tells us is when we go into our lives, there are people all around us that need our witness. There are people that want to hear our witness. They want to hear what we've had to say. They ask you questions. You say, do you believe in eternal life? You have an option to answer. What is your church doing? Why do you go to church? What makes God's... I mean, you have these questions cast to you all the time where somebody will say, oh, you know, ask them. They go to church or ask them. They, uh, hit it. You know? When, when it comes up, open your mouth and speak into it. People wouldn't be asking if they didn't want to know. Because here's the thing. You can probably go on the internet and find this. There are a million reasons not to speak to people about Christ. I don't know about, you know, I've heard half of them. I don't know about enough about the Bible. I don't understand what's going on in church. I really, nobody's really taught me how to pray. I don't really, am not really good with my language. You know, you and Pastor Keith are so good at saying words. You know, I've heard a million, there's a million reasons not to tell anyone about Christ, not to speak about Jesus, but there's only one good reason to speak to anyone about Christ. And that is that people, and specifically the people you know, matter to God. Do you understand that? People matter to God. And we are the ones that love God, that know God, that can testify with our living, so certainly we can testify with our mouths. It is so easy because it's free to us. There was a, Meat Locker in Philadelphia about 40 years ago had a power outage. And after a couple hours, you know, they had to get rid of the meat. The meat was going bad, and this kid was walking down the street, and they came out and said, kid, come in here. What kind of meat does your family like? And he says, tells them what kind of family. They give him five pounds of meat. Kid hasn't had five pounds of meat in his life. He just clutches it to his chest, tells him thank you, and he runs down the street to his home, puts it away wherever he Put it. About an hour later, that same kid was coming down the street. Outside the meat locker, there were like 200 people standing in line. And the owner of the meat locker said, Kid, what did you do to me? Who did you tell? He said, Are you kidding me? This is the best news I ever had free meat. I told everybody. I told everybody I knew, everybody in my neighborhood. And the question is, do we speak about Jesus like that? I get to be, you know, in eternity with all those of you that believe. And it's a free gift to me. I did nothing to earn it. Who am I telling? Who are you telling? Philip's ministry, I think, offers a couple challenges. He says this, to those outside the gospel, the good news is for you. Let nothing abate you from getting there. The good news is to those that are outside the gospel. It's interesting to me, if you read the scriptures, and I do. There's no record of Philip ever preaching in a church. There's no record of Philip ever preaching to Christians. 
He spent all of his time outside the church trying to guide people inside the church and rarely came in there to speak himself because he wanted to bring people to Christ. And secondly, a second challenge that Philip's ministry puts in front of us is to those of us that are here who have received Christ. Understand this. You may not disqualify anyone from hearing the gospel. You may not disqualify anyone from hearing about Jesus. Not because you're reluctant. I mean, there are people in the world that may not have heard the gospel when I was younger because I was reluctant to share it. There are people in your life that may not hear the gospel because of your reluctance, and we are forbidden to be reluctant in that way. You cannot disqualify anyone from hearing about Jesus, nor can you let your assumptions about another person. I've had people come to me and say, oh, he's a hard-drinking, hard-living kind of guy. He wouldn't want to hear about this. How do you know? Best way to find out if he doesn't want to hear about it is tell him. Right? If someone says to you, I don't want to hear about that, you'll know right away. I don't want to hear about that. Right? I mean, it's really not that hard. It's not rocket science up here. But I know many cases where people have gone to friends and said, you know, he's a hard-drinking guy, he's a hard-living guy, or a hard woman, or something like that. And they've just said a question. And they've opened their whole lives and transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Do not disqualify Christians, anyone, from hearing the gospel. There's a man named Tom Long, seminary professor. He, uh, where does he teach? Duke? Har Emory, Emory. He's at Emory University in Atlanta. And he's uh, been a famous preacher for a long time, written 17 books, preached over a thousand sermons, and he tells this story. I was at a lunch once with him, and he told this story. And this is how we'll bring it home. He says, you know, preachers, I had a dream a couple weeks ago, and I can't get it out of my head. I've preached thousands of sermons. I've written, you know, a dozen and a half books. But it was a dream where I met God face to face. And he says, Tom, you've met my son. To whom did you go? And to whom have you told about my son? I remember hearing him tell that story. And I said, that's the perfect story for a congregation. You know about the Son of God, Jesus Christ firstborn from the dead, the great I am, the Messiah. You know about that. He came to you. To whom have you gone with him? And to whom have you told about him? See, the message is simple. Philip went, so we go. Philip spoke, so we tell. Let's pray. Oh, Lord Jesus Christ, you never meant to keep a thing a secret. You told everything. You showed everything. You opened enough of eternity for us to see what the truth and life is. And you command us to go and tell everyone about you. And so, Lord Jesus, we just ask that we might be given that courageous spirit that we need, that you might... Uh, reduce our reluctance, that you might give us fear, 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 fearsomeness in, in testifying. Lord, we know we don't have the right words. We never did. We know we're not educated enough. We probably won't ever be. But we do know that you are ours and we are yours. And if we are called, if we see opportunity to testify, you'll give us everything we need and more importantly, everything the person that desires to hear will need to know. In Jesus' name, we pray in advance of many testimonies and the great expansion of your gospel. Amen.